Welcome to Writing Stories that Engage Young Readers. We're going to be introducing ourselves, so we'll start off with Helen. Uh, my name is Helen Holder, and I've been writing since about the 1990s, and I belong to a writing group for a, while it was there, and taken some workshops, but it was only last year, starting in March, when I actually got some books published. So then I had one every month from July through January, and I have one more in the pipeline. So this is exciting to uh, share anything that I know, which may not be a lot, but I hope you're, we hope you have lots of questions. Yes. And I'm Catherine Sullivan. I started writing when I was 14. So I've written some one picture book, a um, couple of middle grade stories, Crystal Throne, some YA with short stories. And again, like Helen, I'm expecting to get a lot of questions. I'm surprised we didn't get a lot of the panelists also joining us who wrote other picture books that I've been, I've been listening to their panels like, all oh, right, I can, they can. Anyhow, um, so what I'm gonna start off with is I'm gonna do a brief screen share because Helen and I are gonna throw around a lot of terms that may not be familiar with people. So let me bring up the different terms we're gonna be using and first off is what are we talking about when we mention board books, picture books, early readers, chapter books, middle grade versus young adult? Because when you say children's books, that's the whole gambit right there. And each one is different age level, word count, how many pages it's going to be. And nowadays, with a lot of self-publishing, those picture lengths may be different. The word count may be different. Uh, when Harry Potter came along, the word count for middle grade books jumped spectacularly. So just a brief summary. Helen, do you want to start off with um, any? Sure. Uh, the books that I've been writing are primarily the picture books and ages two to, two to seven. And um, the first thing that you need to do is be sure that you have read, 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 read lots of books in whatever age group or whatever category you are interested in. Uh, for me, mine are kind of uh, differing, some read aloud as well as early writers, although on the, on the later side, because for the read alouds, you. Um, can use a greater vocabulary. Um, I started out with things, the things that inspired me were what some kids said, like I painted a magenta flamingo, or I'll take my grandma to a sleepover. Um, but you can also look at things that are interesting of kids. They're usually very interested in animals and the animal world. So one of my books is, has a lot of facts about flamingos. One of them has a lot of facts about all different kinds of animal tongues. And then you can look at what are kids' experiences. So you really do need to be looking to at and listening to what kids are doing. But you also need to consider the adult reader because if it turns out to be some kid's favorite book, the adult may have to read it 200 times. So. <laughs> Uh, for especially in the ones that you expect people to be reading aloud, you, you can have a pretty broad vocabulary and the pictures can give a context as, as well as what the story is about for words that you want to stretch the vocabulary a little beyond just what kids say because their listening vocabulary is a lot bigger. Um, your plots can be pretty simple, simple, but you can you can have a lot of surprises in there. Helen, Kristen is asking you to hold up your books if you hold oh. up some of them. All right. Well, this is uh, terrific tongues, which is a lot of information about various animals. Um, this was sleepover with grandma, which one of my grandchildren said they were going to take me on their sleepover. 
but you don't want this grandma to come to your house. <laughs> uh, Glorious Gertie's fabulous fireworks is just, just a for fun story. Doesn't really have any specific purpose, I guess. <laughs> I painted a magenta flamingo. It's kind of uh, putting um, imagination of the person painting the magenta flamingo versus his sister who's a know-it-all. So she gives all the facts about flamingos while he just goes right off on the, on the, on the imagination of whatever goes. <laughs> Uh, an unusual tale is kind of a different uh, take on the fairy tale genre. And the first one I had was David's Pretzels, which is an alphabet book. And so um, one of the things I think um, when you're when you're thinking about what you're going to write, you need to remember that as I say, from early readers, you want to limit your vocabulary in some respects, but and make a lot of use of the pictures and the context clues. And a rhyming is really good in the early reader books because once they can read cat, then they can figure it out, rat, bat, and hat, the whole works. So <laughs> for the early reader, you want to be careful too, as far as your plots, just because you have to remember that the, um, the early readers, a lot of their energy is going into the figuring out the words. So you don't want to get too complicated with and too many surprises because they may, they may get lost in between there. So as I say, I mainly write for the two to seven year olds and mainly the read aloud crowd. Do you make any difference between nonfiction or fiction, or do you have a story in with your nonfiction? Um, Terrific Tongues was, the, the, that one was, is pretty much all nonfiction. So that, that is, it has little things like snakes use their tongues for smelling and um, anteaters find ants and termites, termites with theirs. And then it has a lot more specific facts about how does the, the snake use his tongue for smelling. Um, then has just fun things too, like uh, brats stick theirs out. <laughs> Here's the brat sticking her tongue out. <laughs> and then, then there are facts about the human tongue. So in this particular one, sticking out your tongue in Tibet, maybe how you greet somebody that you've just met them. Or if you're a Murray, man from New Zealand, you're showing your fierceness and your strength, but you use your tongue for mashing your food and moving it around in your mouth. So uh, those are both kind of the main nonfiction ones I've done. The, I painted a magenta flamingo as both the, 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 the boy is saying, I painted a magenta flamingo and then his sister says, oh, you know, magenta, they're not magenta, they're pink. And why are that she tells why they're pink. And he has them making a nest out of diamonds and rubies and she, no, no, they make it out of mud. And so that's kind of a combination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now my picture book's more for the older tweens. So it's a lot more, a lot more words per page versus a straightforward picture book for the younger ones where you only have a couple words per page. Yeah. Then it was more of a fantasy story where a boy finds an elk in his backyard and goes from there. Yeah, I think as you, as you move up, of course, you can use bigger vocabularies. You can use more complicated plots. But as I said, you don't have to be worried too much about um, uh, expanding the vocabulary. In fact, David's pretzels, I purposely, each page has a word that might not be familiar, like quadrille or uh, orpingtons or jabiru, antimacassar, galoshes. But then at the back of the book is a glossary. So you've, I've taught then how do you, when you don't know a word, what do you do? I'm going to encourage people to read the dictionaries. 
So it was fun when one parent said to me that she was sitting in the dentist office and reading a book with her kid who she'd read David's pretzels to. And she started to just read the book while they were waiting for his brothers. And he says, does this book have a glossary? <laughs> so I, yes, accomplished the goal. Yeah. Check to see if there's any questions so far. We do have a compliment. Kindergartners and old yeah. kids appreciate cryptic tongues. Yay. That's good. I have several, I have several uh, fans who have bought every single one of my books. And one of them was a fourth grader who was very just enjoyed them a lot. So she's I told her she was the uh, president of my Austin fan club. So <laughs> Now, when writing um, more of an older picture book, when you start getting into the early readers, um, we're always told on science fiction panels, you don't write down to the kids. They always reading, they're always reading a, a year older than themselves. And I've been running into like middle grade stories that make a lot of slang references or they basically refer to television shows that are happening right now and while it's cool to read that you have to realize that book in the future is going to be oh that's really quaint that was my dad's favorite tv show <laughs> or that's a slang expression that fell out of favor oh gosh two years ago nobody uses that word anymore how do you keep fresh well, I think you do have to consider that kind of thing because if you're if you're only referencing things for right now, obviously you don't think you've written the classic. <laughs> Let's see, we do have a couple questions in the question and answer section. Uh, Jennifer is asking, where do you get your inspiration for children's books? From your own imagination, children, grandparents? Well, what? I taught I taught first grade for thirty or thirty three years. And the kids say things. And that's that's primarily what has been the inspiration for a lot of my books, as well as my grandchildren, two grandchildren. One said I painted a magenta flamingo, and that's how I took off for that one. And the one little girl said she was gonna take me with her on her sleepover. So you can just find it whatever you see or hear, and it's and it's good to keep a Keep a journal, keep writing down all those things because today you might hear something, some funny word or some funny thing that tomorrow will be your inspiration. Well, Michael and the Elf, when I wrote that back when I was starting to write around 14, my one of my nephews had ears or he resembled me as an elf. He reminded <laughs> me of that. So it's like, okay, Brian, you get to be the elf and his older cousin, you're gonna be Michael and it just went from there. Uh, let's see, got that question answered. I'm trying to bring the screen back up. And Chris Markout wanted to know how do you decide on an illustrator? Um, I had illustrated David's pretzels myself, but I am not comfortable, say, with my fairy tale one. Um, then you'd have to be, not only to draw people, you'd have to. Um, have to be consistent in your drawing. And so I thought, yeah. So when I uh, contacted my publisher, Fox Point, then they have illustrators. And so I have uh, Kayla Olson Surface has illustrated most of my books. One, Samantha Hinton did the Flamingo one, but um, otherwise, as I say, I, I, Fox Point has illustrators right there and it's and Kayla's worked out really well so and Guardian Angel which unfortunately closed in November so I can't recommend publisher because can't get there had a list of illustrators and I basically looked through their various works and going oh can I have this illustrator so a lot of times it's we don't really make our decisions on illustrator we can right. basically make decisions from what list is handed to us but but it is important to work, I mean, to, to have a good relationship with the illustrator, but they can, um, 
they can see things that you might not have thought, or, or they may see it a different way. Uh, Glorious Gertie, I happen to think of her as a little old lady, <laughs> but in but Kayla drew her as a happening or young thing, and it really works out well. So it turns out some of it's fun too. Uh, Nancy Ellenson asked us if we think it's easier or more difficult to write a picture book. Um, the, the book that I have in the pipeline now is going to rely a lot on the illustrator because the words are sort of general. So we'll see how that works out. But I think it, it is harder to write a picture book because, as I say, you have the picture in your mind, but then your illustrator may see it slightly a different way and it may turn out to be better. They may have a better idea just because they're the illustrator and so it works out. And it's hard sometimes to remember not to get, into, if you've been writing adult books or even young adult books, it's hard to remember that get your vocabulary back down to not writing down, but basically making a little more simplified so that they don't need multi-syllable words right off the bat. Yeah. And Patricia asked how we paid the illustrator. Again, um, my publisher, I work through them to pay the, pub, the illustrator, the editor, the designer, the whole works. Yeah, and it's my publisher basically paid that unless I wanted to go differently, in which case the illustrator offered their rates because we're both with small press. So I think some of these questions might be more designed for self-publishing. Right, yeah. like, I can't really answer that one, but there were several other um, authors of picture books in this conference. So you could probably find those recordings and then ask that person. And Victoria wants to know what are some other ways to learn about writing for children? I think you have to, as if you've been reading children's books and then you've got some ideas and write them down and find some children to test them out on. They'll let, they'll let you know whether, whether it's working or not, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, beta readers are the best thing because they can actually read them. They can read it and say, oh, I don't understand this. Right. I or, like that character. Or they listen to you read a page and go walking off somewhere. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Interesting. Let's see. We have Teresa says there are some books that are bigger picture book style, but have a lot more words. Yeah, that's you've got early readers, you've also got the tweens, and this is more of a tween book. Yeah, and you're going to have to kind of decide whether the picture is going to carry your story or the words. I mean, they work together, but it can be both. And I think anything, the picture books are pretty much, if you have a picture on every page and the words are, are the picture is more than the words, so to speak, the, the, the size that you could still call it a picture book. And Melinda in chat is recommending some art programs to find markets to find illustrator if you're an indie publisher, indie author. So don't forget to check the chat. Uh, Jenny is asking, do you recommend book size for each category? That's my publisher. I don't answer that question. How about you, <laughs> Helen? Same thing with you, Helen? Uh, well, yeah, pretty, I would you just recommend a book size for each category. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So they're pretty much all the same size, but, um, you can kind of go with whatever your publisher thinks, uh, is best for you, so. <laughs> yeah, because sometimes you don't go against your publisher uh, unless you decide you want to be indie, po indie author. Let's see. Oh well, yeah, I was just, I was so, I, uh, I had sent out to some publishers, but I didn't know how you got an agent or all the, the normal, the traditional publishing um, way and then, I happened to have an acquaintance who had published some books and I saw, oh, she's got a publisher right here in Austin. So that was how I 
got together with my publisher, who's like uh, right here in Austin. So I talked to the publisher and I probably would be talking more, except it, I started right before the uh, shutdown of everything. And Melinda in the chat says, most editors I know steer clear of rhyming text, mostly because it's so difficult to do well. I've seen, I received favorable reviews from my picture book that rhymed, and I'm just curious as to your take. Uh, I didn't go rhyming because as a 14 year old, I really didn't like rhyming books. How about you? Yeah. Uh, well, just the one, the David's Pretzels is a rhyming, rhyming book. Um, and I, I think, yeah, you're right that it, it's hard to come up with the rhymes then, and it needs to be done well. Um, you know, it, it just, whatever fits for your story, that happened to just fit a is for an antimacassar, B is for a beak, C is for the crocodiles crawling to the creek. It just <laughs> worked out that way. <laughs> so that particular book, I worked on the rhyming, but I, I don't think I would usually go with rhyming just, um, just because it is hard. So, so some of them get really, really silly. You know, J is for a Jabiru, K for Katie did. L is for the go get the pot and don't forget the lid. I mean, it's just totally silliness. Let's see. And Barb is asking, where did you learn about the format for the manuscript to submit to the small press? And do you make a dummy to work on things like page turns? The second question is asking more isn't in the author. I don't. But where you learn about the format, let me bring up. Uh, science fiction writers, let's see. I've got too many windows open. So the Society of Children's Illustrators, um, that website basically will give you some hints. Also, Railing is a good market listing. So every small press has their own guidelines. Follow their guidelines unless you want to be rejected. So you've got that particular society will list the sample uh, manuscript size. Raylan will also give you the guide, will give you to the, get you to the publishers and they will list their own preferences. Don't ignore that. Helen, you got any? Yeah, that's pretty much, I think you have, I, I guess I was lucky because I could go, as I say, my publisher is right here in Austin. And so I, I we met, them over lunch and I just handed them. Um, so the one manuscript, the David's pretzels that I had illustrated myself was already like pages in a book. The other ones I had just typed out, um, uh, double space typing on the papers. But if, if you're, I, I would say for whatever the publishers say they want to see, that's what you have to do. And I had, um, I was I was lucky that I could just go right and talk to, right straight to them, <laughs> to their face, so to speak, and, and just hand them my manuscripts. But that's not always available to you, but. Especially not right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but thank goodness for email. Because when I first got my picture book written, I submitted via email and I could put in examples, just type out examples of what maybe the illustration could be, but they basically just wanted the text at that point. Yeah. And, and things like the page turns. Um, so my fairy tale book, An un, Unusual Tale, the, the, uh, there was a designer who pretty much decided where the illus where there should be an illustration and where there should be um, a page turn, and um, ha there had to be some things that I changed to make it work out better. But that's that's why it's important to have editors and designers because let's face it, we really love our own words. 
<laughs> so somebody else who who can tell you uh, this is not working and then you either have to decide well yeah but that's the way i wanted it to be or figure out how you can make it work better uh victoria asks using young children as beta readers sound great but you also belong to a writing group of other adults who write for children i don't how about you ellen um i uh, when I was teaching, I'm retired, but when I was teaching our, in our school, we had a little group of teachers who were um, writing, and that's the only time I've been in a writer's group. Um, I think it would be helpful, and probably I should start one <laughs> so I could have one, but um, just because it's good to have people adults and children to bounce your ideas off of, to bounce your writing off of. So <clears throat> I've pretty much been, um, read, I've read my grandchildren is, is the first place where, <laughs> where I go. And I was hoping that, oh, and Paula says she has several teachers who read her, her manuscripts and let them know. Uh, Mary, uh, that's a good source yeah. too, especially if you're writing for younger children because they're familiar with what goes and what doesn't. And Mary Hillman, hi Mary. Uh, we might have some students joining us from the Young Writers and, and Artists Conference today. What advice do you have for young authors just getting started in their writing careers, especially when writing for peer or younger children? And as Helen already mentioned, read. Read a lot of the books see what other people are doing and how they handle it. Uh, I didn't start writing my fantasy stories until I had already finished the Lord of the Rings and a couple of other fantasy books at that time. And when I started writing the picture book, I was looking back through my the old picture books that I grew up reading going, whoa, hey, how does this setup work? Helen? Yeah, I, I think that if you, and you just write, I, I liked yesterday, um, the next person that's going to be up, Margie Prius said, just write, 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 write. And she said, some of it you write is going to be junk. And when you look at it the next day, you're going to think, whoa, that was really bad. <laughs> and I think for little kids, for kids, when you're writing, just write, 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 write as much as you can, because you can always go back and decide that's not what I want to write to work further on to make it presentable to the world or you know it may be something you think oh, I'll kind of throw that in the trash because I've thrown things in the trash too so it's not bad yeah and beta readers are always good because the first version I wrote the crystal throne I was in high school I kept sharing chapters with my fellow friends and the, especially the one girl that I was basing the main character on so she liked it a lot <laughs> But basically sharing your work and see what type of feedback you get back. You, you may not always decide that, they, that you like what they're saying. It's like, okay, but you can try. And yeah, it looks like we got a couple more questions. Uh, to first I wanted to know if you've ever written a short piece from magazines. Um, the only one that I've I've written some things that I don't know where, where they should go. They're obviously not children's books or even a book book, but, um, and, and the one, one I wrote was just uh, the, uh, the local paper has a art supplement that they put out once a year. And so I, I just submitted that, but that's like, you're giving it away for free. And that's, uh, that's the only thing I've written. It was about Amish friendship bread. So it was kind of a, Hilarious thing about how becoming a slave to this bread. <laughs> you have to feed it and massage it. <laughs> and Kim asked about it when writing. Wait a minute, let me answer my part. Okay. Because I have written short stories for uh, fantasy magazines and science fiction magazines. It took a long time before, because I was starting off with the big name, uh, fan magazine, science fiction, and fantasy, analog, um, Isaac Asimov magazine. But there were a lot of small press magazines at that time. Now you're thinking, you're, the second part of Chris's questions. I have a piece I think would be work good for a magazine, but I don't know how to approach it. 
I put up the link to Raylan.com. Raylan lists magazines as well as books, and they have the guidelines. So you can always just go to Raylan, look up what might be suited, because they list it by who's looking for what, as well as where the guidelines are. So it's R-A-L-A-N.com. And approach it that way, because a lot of the short stories I had published in magazines ended up in my short story collection. So you can see, actually see it. Okay, Kim is asking, when writing the story, do you compose the story and worry about how it will break out into pages of a book later? Or do you envision the essential scenes and organize your writing to facilitate those scenes? The second part of that question works great if you're doing a picture book. When I'm writing the story, I write the story. I'm not gonna figure out how the page breaks work. Helen? Oh, that's, yeah, that's pretty much the same, that if you're, doing a picture book, well, then you've got to think about the picture and what words are going to go with that picture. But like my fairy tale one, I just wrote, get the story out here. <laughs> and then the essentially the illustrator and the um, uh, designer decided where the page breaks were going to be. Again, if you're doing more of an indie author approach, there are several good authors who out present on other panels, and I'm quite sure, uh, I think Melinda was mentioning a few things, so she might be a person to ask. You're talking to two small press authors, so it's like, mm, the publisher makes those decisions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, it looks like we ran out of questions. We need to check the chat. Uh, we should be good. Okay. So, oh, good. Melinda has her email address in the chat. So any of you have questions about indie author, indie publishing, you got her email address right there. Uh, let's see, Kristen is asking, which books are your favorite of those you've written and why? <sighs> well, I'll go with Crystal Throne because that was the first full book I wrote as a 14 year old, it's been rewritten and revised many, many, many times. It took me a long time to find a publisher, but when it finally came out in print, I won an award for it. So like, okay, this is good. But of course, the favorite one's always what I'm working on at the moment. Ellen? Well, my favorite one is Glorious Gertie's Fabulous Fireworks because it's just totally for fun. And it just, I had to do a lot of research to find out, oh my goodness, all these fireworks have names. So that was kind of fun, but it's just totally silly story. Doesn't have any, I don't know, you might have to look really hard to find a lesson in the story. <laughs> <laughs> Which is one of the things I, um, you can either think of a lesson you want to teach or to, to have your young readers figure out and then write the story to match that, I tend to do more of write the story and let the lesson come out of whatever the story is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like with middle grade stories, I tend to want to make sure the characters are interesting and the relationships are interesting. I'm not gonna hit somebody over the head with, there's this huge message like, no, no. You're gonna. They may read the book, but they're never gonna pick it up again. If they, if you write interesting characters, people want to read it. Well, Victoria wants to know about indie authors. <laughs> we just. Well, it's. Uh, it keeps evolving. For a long time, it was just basically self-published, and small press back in those days were calling themselves indie publishers because. They weren't one of the big traditional big five. I think they're down to big four. And then the self-published authors took over the term saying they're indie published because they are not reliant on any particular small press. So that's basically what I'm using that in terms of. So I, I will still run into small press publishers are going, no, 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 we are indie publishers. We are not reliant. Okay. The terms keep evolving. Yeah. And and it's there's many different ways to get your book published. I mean, you can go the traditional route and, and that may re will, uh, requires you to have an agent who 
first decides whether they want to shop your book and then they shop it around to the publishers. Um, I'm, as I say, I'm going with a local publisher right here who is that uh, they have, they hook me up with the illustrators, the editors, the designers, and the printer. And, um, or you can do self-publishing. Um, I was trying to do uh, David's pretzels myself uh, through Amazon and uh, forgot what was the other one that I was trying, but I was having a hard time because the way that I had formatted a book myself didn't work with what they, because they have kind of standard formats. So I was having trouble with how do I, okay, I drew all these pictures, but they're not gonna be the right shape for the books that they have. And how do I get them to be the right shape? And that was when I found the publishers I had. So the Chelsea, my designer took my pictures and got them the right shape to fit in the book. So that was my, my route that, there's lots of routes to check. And, and the way I found this was a person that I knew, an acquaintance here in Austin who had published a book. So, you know, look around who's, who's publishing the books that you see in the bookstore. And you may find you've got a publisher right close that you can hook up with. Mm -hmm. And usually the distinction is traditional publishers have a big distribution, you need an agent and they pay royalties small press, don't have the distribution, but you do not have to worry about an agent. You get the royalties, bigger royalties than you do with the traditional uh, Traditional publishers would uh, get contracts settled with Audible overseas. That's by your agent. So a small press, if you've got your contract written right, you still have your Audible. Um, now I'm blanking on how to read the books read. Yeah. <laughs> Audible books, whatever. <laughs> yeah. You have a contract for that. You have to go find contracts for overseas. So you're working a little bit harder. But when you're when you're an indie publisher, when you're self-published, I'm too lazy. There's too much work involved with that because you have to figure out the layout. You have to figure out the editing. You have to figure out um, who's doing the pictures and contracts between Kindle and Nooks and I'm too lazy. And Melinda's basically commenting, yeah, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah, basically um, Melinda's saying is an indie author will open more doors if you can mark your book as returnable and Ingram is the book directory most buyers use. Yes. And, and I am fortunate too that here in Austin, we have a, a, a small bookstore who really is, is into helping. Mm -hmm. So she, she has done interviews and she, as soon as the, uh, virus closed everything down she did what she called porch interviews with her with authors and so and and she promotes your books on her website and so it's uh really good to have that 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 small bookstore that's oh, yes. local and really helpful yeah because i've in winona paperbacks and pieces is really good at promoting authors and Right now, because this publisher closed down, you can't get it on Amazon anymore. You can't get it through the Nook, but paperbacks and pieces still has copies. So it, it's nice to have bookstores that are willing to promote authors because they'll take it. They may take your book on consignment, but it's there where people can find it. Any other questions? I'm so right in and get. How do you write engaging stories, Helen? Well, if if I kind of liked it, then maybe somebody else would like it. <laughs> but you know, and, and now I'm now I'm kind of stuck with uh, that that fairy tale book. I I ended it with, well, that's a story for another night. So 
I have people who are looking for the other story, so <laughs> I'm stuck with writing that one. And then uh, the uh, I painted a magenta flamingo. One of the uh, beta readers said, "Well, they could hardly wait till I did some other animals." <laughs> so mm -hmm. It's like, okay, oh. well, <laughs> obviously, you're oh, I, I have several. <laughs> I have several goings. I have that fairy tale and I have another animal book and I have uh, uh, another silly one. And then there's, I just heard this silly word. So I'm trying to work that into a story. So I think I have about four or five. So I can kind of start writing over here. And if that dries up, I can go work on another one. <laughs> uh, Victoria is asking that what at which type of publishers are writers expected to pay part of publishing costs? The money comes to the author. Um, small press, no. They don't expect you to pay part of the cost. Traditional, no. Um, so. <laughs> oh, yeah. If you're doing a vanity press, beware because yeah, you are paying all the costs you end up with a box of books in your garage because they're not going to do any promotion for you where the small press will. Yeah, I've got, uh, as I say, they've hooked me up with the illustrator, the designer, the uh, editors, and um, they also uh, push my books on lots of different places and uh, also, let me know about opportunities for book festivals like this and uh, adver advertising in different magazines and it, it is expensive. I will say that um, the, the thing about making a living before this, I think for picture books and children's books, you would probably have to be pretty famous to make it be your living. I have. Uh, I'm retired and have a pension, so I don't have to worry about making a living, but uh, um, it is expensive to do picture books because you do have to pay the illustrator and that's a big part of the book too, so. Kirsten's basically saying hybrid publisher does traditional service, but money is needed up front. I haven't won the lottery yet. Hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah, because the only times I've come across um, people demanding money is usually the scams. So is it actually people who are? No, you know, yeah, it's, I'm, uh, I'm, I paid those people. I paid those people, the editors and the illustrator and the uh, designer. So I have a lot invested, but I don't have to have, um, um, I can, get the, my books printed on demand. So I don't have to um, have a garage full have a garage full of books. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see, Mary Ellen. And is my publisher is saying I'm going to be surprised when the world opens up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hopefully. Oh, nice. I like the comment she adds underneath that. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I will be able to make my living. <laughs> Um, what's the average cost of children's books? Uh, let's see. This publisher asked for $10.95, and whenever I was selling it at a convention, I basically knocked it down to nine. Oh, uh, I, thought, I didn't know she meant cost of publishing or... Oh, yeah. I yeah, didn't... yeah the, the prices are, yeah, in the $12 to $15 range. $15, yeah, definitely. Or, well, but that's soft on, cover, hard cover. Printed. Yeah. Yeah, oh, the hardcovers are usually about 25 or 20. Yeah. But if she's talking about what she has the cost of publishing, yeah. Oh, yeah, she just clarified. So, so it would be, it's a little bit less than that for, and that's including um, my getting, I do have a supply of 20 of each of my books, soft and hardcover, so that people, you know, I had somebody walk into my house and wanted one of each. So there you go. <laughs> Yeah, Mary Ellen's asking, clarified it to cost of publishing. In. Yeah, so I would say it was like $2,000 for oh. each uh, each picture book. Because the, the pictures do, I mean, that adds up pretty fast. Okay. But and I, I'm, I'm so happy with my illustrator. I'm, I think it's worth it. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
because those illustrations can actually sell the book. Uh, Melinda and in chat basically has you has a URL for a YouTube video on self publishing. So those people interested in that, go to the chat, click on Melinda's link, and hopefully get some of your questions answered. Because basically, what I'm focusing on when you're trying to engage readers, I want to have more of a timeless story. I want to have interesting characters. Story is always important. Um, and if you actually start going, actually getting into a series, can people predict what's going to happen next? Or do they want, want to find out? Right. <laughs> Uh, Melinda's clarifying in her YouTube. It's a presentation she gave for the Picayune Writers Symposium called Self-Publishing on a Shoestring. Quality independent publishing on a zero, zero to low budget. That sounds good. Yeah. Uh, Victoria asks, do traditional and small press publishers ask the author to pay for illustrators? Uh, I don't think traditionals do. Small press do if you're going to go into a separate line because uh, the small press I went to originally um, wanted just do ebooks. And if you were going to want to do the paper version, then they did ask you to chip in for the illustrators for that. How about you, Helen? In your experience, yeah, well, yeah, that's the way that where I'm a hybrid. My publisher is a hybrid publisher. And so, as I say, they hook me up with, they have the editors on, and the illustrators and um, the designer. And then I paid them. And you can order books through, through my publisher, or you can order books from me, or they also have put it on Amazon. So I don't know. I feel like I'm getting my money's worth. So. <laughs> Okay, I think Joy, Joy wants to come in <laughs> because you have, you we're giving away the five books and I'll read what, or Joy, do you wanna come in and say that? Okay. Yeah, I can, I can announce the winners and then if people have, you know, final questions and things you wanna wrap up, um, we'll give you a chance to do that. But I wanna announce the winners while we, you know, before <laughs> people start deciding they have to go eat lunch or something. Yeah, um, yeah. well, basically, Thank people. I want to thank you guys for attending the session. Hope this helped a little bit, and especially the young writers at the Young Writers Young Artists Conference, in Mankato. Helen, yeah, that's uh, glad to have everybody here. And if you know, you can go check on the um, on the Deep Valley site. It has all our it sends you to the author. So if you have other questions you want to ask, that's the place to go. You can. Find it out. And over to you, Joy. <laughs> thank you. Well, Helen and Catherine, thank you so much. You, um, I don't write children's books, but I feel like now that I've listened to you, if I were interested, I would have so much information to get me going. And if, um, yeah, I'm sure you, you sound like you're just so knowledgeable and, and accessible. So I'm sure if people have questions or want to reach out to you, um, they can find you. Um, and we have two, we have a book from each of you to give away, which is very exciting. Uh, so the first book is Helen's book, An Unusual Tale, and the winner of that is Chris Marcoute. Uh, the second book we have is by Catherine, um, Agents, Adepts, and Apprentices, and the winner of that is Michelle Blake. Our third book is A Wee Bit of Irish Lace, right before St. Patrick's Day, very exciting, uh, by Marianne Waldron, and the winner of that is Nancy Ellenson. Our fourth book is Superhero Joey uh, by Amanda Scow. And the winner of that is Patricia Bacchus. And then our last book is Legend of Goshado by Terry Karsten. And the winner of that is Christine Faust. So if you heard your name, please email, I put it in the chat, uh, contact at deepbellybookfestival.com and then with your email address so we can make sure that you, we can connect you to the authors and they will email you um, the books. And then also the uh, names of all the prize winners throughout this weekend, I'm gonna put that in the chat. 
um, is listed on our website. And so make sure you take a look. If you have if you have been, your name has been called and you haven't yet sent us your email address, please do so. So we make sure that you know that you want the book, uh, that you're, we connect you with the author and uh, because you must be present to win, we wanna get these books out to, to all of you. Our next event um, today is at one o'clock and it's our keynote author, Margie Preus, who will be uh, doing a reading and discussion of her book, The Littlest Voyager. So that will be wonderful. Um, and be sure to check out our, our website for all the other things going on this afternoon. Um, lots of great, lots of great uh, options. So, and also things are being recorded. So you can, you know, if you have to go walk your dog or something, come back and, and watch it later. Thanks again, uh, Helen and Catherine. It was such a wonderful event. Thanks to all of you for participating and uh, we'll see you later. Thank you.